ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره is the sound okay verily the praise is for allah we praise him we seek his assistance we seek his forgiveness ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا we seek refuge with Allah from the evils of our own selves and from the consequences of our bad deeds. مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ Whoever Allah guides, there is no one who can lead him astray and whoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide him. أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ I openly testify that there is no one worthy of worship other than Allah who is alone without any partners. And I further testify that Muhammad was his servant and final messenger. What is the connection, as I'm asking you now, those of you who attended last week, perhaps you know, what is the connection to something in this khutbat al-haja to mawqaf al-muslim in al-fitna that you can recall? Does anyone know? can recall I'm relying on I guess Salah to identify those who would either stand up or raise their hands or indicate that they are prepared to answer one of the ways to keep yourself on guard against fitna and not to give in to fitna من شرور أنفسنا أيوة. وسيئات أعمالنا من قال who said that أهلا يا نفيس بارك الله فيك ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا from the evil of our own selves we seek refuge with Allah and from the consequences of our bad deeds explain the connection to keeping yourself far from fitna يا نفيس يقول بالعربي كذا <تصفيق> طيب uh, نعم الهذر من المعصية one of our points was to be on guard against personal disobedience being on guard against sinfulness and we mentioned how Allah Ta'ala sent the Jews Bani Israel astray because of the evil that was within their own selves, because of the the deviance in their own hearts. And we said, فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ When they strayed and deviated, meaning with disobedience and contradiction to the orders of Allah, then Allah sent their hearts, or Allah put deviation in their hearts. If Allah put Ta'ala put deviation in their hearts, that means He's from those who we say, مَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ as well. Connect it right back to khutbat al haja If Allah sends someone astray due to the sins and due to his opposition to the orders of Allah, then there is no guide for him. Because Allah Ta'ala has sent his heart astray. So then we said we benefit from this a kind of fear. A fear that our own personal acts of disobedience could lead to Allah Ta'ala sending our hearts astray. And so we said one of the most important ways to protect yourself from fitan, al-fitan al-mudilla, the fitnas that take people astray, is that you stay on guard against disobedience. Excellent, Ya Nafis. Who knows another way that we talked about, and I think we mentioned all in all ten. I might have said I'm going to introduce eight or nine. By the time we finished, by Allah's grace, we covered about ten methods or means through which to protect yourself from fitan. And just to review as well before I ask for more, I will say what kind of fitan is it that we are concerned about in this lecture or this series of lectures? As we said, there are many kinds of fitnas. What is the fitna that we're worried about and we are interested in taking steps to protect ourselves from it?
تفضل خليل Is this Khalil from way back Khalil or is this a new Khalil? New Khalil. حياك الله خليلي. تفضل. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. What is it? The fitan of doubts. Yeah, straying due to doubts, due to confusion in the religion. Excellent. يا أخي يا خليلي. Jazakallah khairan. So it's the fitna, the trials and tribulations that come about as a result of a person being confused in his religion, doubting the correctness of the straight path, not understanding what the straight path is, and not understanding why the deviant paths are to be uh, shunned and to be stayed away from. Excellent, ya akhi. Barakallahu feek. So then we had an, a series of points that we could use that we basically derived either directly or indirectly from the book of Allah and from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who will volunteer to assist us by reviewing one of those ten naam Abdullah ibn Abdul ibn uh, ibn Salah Is that you alaykum salam wa rahmatullah is that you big boy Yeah How are you Abdullah This is Abdullah ibn Salah right We miss you little brother you were over here for a minute. We miss you. Abbas misses you. You're going to tell us one of the ten things, Akhi? Boy, speak up and enunciate. <laughs> I don't think it's your fault that, you know, this is overseas and all that. But ex maybe a Salah can express that for me since he's on the mic. What did he say? Was making dhikr one of them? Was he here and he's asking about what he missed? Or is he recollecting what he was here and he heard? What he was here for and he heard? He's unsure. Okay. Well, for sure the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala grants you closeness to Allah Ta'ala. And closeness to Allah Ta'ala can protect you from fitna and straying. And so that's not excluded from our discussion. However, it wasn't one of the points that we mentioned from what I recall. Jazakallahu khairan. And that's excellent. That's a very excellent point and often neglected by the Muslims who are fully capable of doing so. Surah Al Fatiha and its meanings should be studied and should be known by new Muslims and by Muslims uh, who've been in Islam for a long time. Surah Al Fatiha is the oft repeated prayer that you use to address Allah Ta'ala, your conversation with Allah Ta'ala. In your salat, so then you should know Ihdina Surat al Mustaqim what you are asking for with this mighty and beautiful verse. Many people would say, Guide us to the straight path. And they would say the straight path is Islam, so guide us to the straight path. So someone might say that we should adjust our understanding of Ihdina Surat al Mustaqim from simply guide us to the straight path to something else which has a richer meaning. What would that be? طيب اهدنا الصراط المستقيم you may find it translated as guide us to the straight path in parentheses islam guide us to islam can we adjust this meaning should we adjust this meaning and how would we or should we adjust this meaning as it relates to our topic today
no, what's the meaning of, is it really guide us? Meaning, we're not Muslims and we're asking for guidance to Islam, or is there something richer behind this word, ihdina? Guide us. Ayywa thabitna, ahsant. Athabat, we're asking for the guidance of stability upon the truth after we have recognized it. We're not asking for the guidance to the truth before we have recognized it. We understand what the meaning of Tawheed is, we understand what the meaning of Islam is, we have embraced it. And now we ask Allah for Hidayah. So what is the Hidayah that we're asking for? It's the Hidayah of Thabat. And, uh, you know, continuing to stay on the Haqq after one has accepted it. A kind of guidance that is only sought from Allah Ta'ala. So with this in mind, our Fatiha or our experience reciting Surah Al-Fatiha becomes a richer experience becomes an experience where we have more in mind of what we are asking for. We are not asking to be guided to Islam. We are asking that Allah grants us stability on the truth, on Islam, after we have recognized it, accepted it, and embraced it. And that stability is what we need in the face of fitna. It is what Allah Ta'ala speaks of when He says, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Allah Ta'ala makes the people of Iman, He makes them firm and stable with the firm statement. And that is the statement, the understanding and the application of La ilaha illallah That there is no one worthy of worship other than Allah. Allah makes them stable in this life and in the hereafter. In this life, through the trials and turmoils, the straying and the doubts and the confusion and the religion that are affect that affect some people, Allah Taala gives the people of Iman He gives them stability. With this firm statement, knowing the meaning of La Ilaha Illallah, holding to it, practicing it, and all that it entails. Tayyib. So stability is what is sought after from the first. Point to the tenth point, a quick review so we can start our topic for this evening. The first way that we discussed last time was faith in Allah Ta'ala, al Imanu Billahi, and that's directly taken from that verse. Yuthabitu Allahu Ladina Amanu, Bil Qawdith Thabiti. That Allah Ta'ala grants the people of Iman, He grants them stability by way of the Qawl al Thabit, Al Qawl al Thabit. Naam, uh, the firm statement. Of oneness of the oneness of Allah Taala. So the people who have iman in Allah, they are granted stability from Allah based on this verse. Turning back to Allah with sincerity and honesty, and asking Him for uh, protection and shelter from the strayings that are out there, from the various ways that we seek refuge with Allah. All of them are asking for refuge from Allah. And the statement in our Fatiha that we mentioned, إِهْدِينَ الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim, Guide us to stability. Grant us stability upon the straight path. We said thirdly, the tamassuk bi al-sunnah. Holding tightly, tenaciously to the sunnah due to the hadith of Al-Irbad. عَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ عَضُّ عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذِ I sort of reorganized them, so I'm putting this as the third. I might have, like I said, I started out with eight in the beginning of the lecture, and I ended up with ten. So there could be some contradiction to what you have written. With me? Don't worry about the numbers. The numbers are not legislated or of any real importance, except that it's the numbering that, or the, the order that they were presented to you. That's all it is. So the third one is? In my list here, uh, before that, put al-iltija'u ila Allah bi sidqi wal ikhlas, turning to Allah with honesty and sincerity. That's the understanding your Fatiha when you read it, and the connection to ihdin al-surat al-mustaqim. The third point, or as the sister told us. Or reminded us of, know what you are reciting when you read Surah Al Fatiha. Third point was sticking to the Sunnah tenaciously. Because in that hadith of Al Ilbad, he said, 
I advise you to stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. At what occasion and in what context did he make this, did he offer this advice? He said, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِ سَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي He said, whoever lives after me, then he's going to see a lot of differing. So then he must hold to my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa, the righteous, the rightly guided caliphs after me. Tayyib, that's the third point. The fourth point is a shukr. Ala sabati indak. The fourth point is being grateful for the amount of stability that Allah has already given you. And Allah says, Wala in shakartum la azidannakum. If you thank me, then I will increase you. Surely and verily. With every type of confirmation, I will increase you. Meaning in whatever you thank me for. So thank Allah for stability, the stability that you have now. That you are not confused like some people are in their religion. Thank Allah for the little, and He will increase it and make it a lot. The fifth point, al-ilm al-shari'i. The knowledge of the, of the Islamic texts. The Islamic, knowledge of Islam in general. From the hadith of al-Irbad, from the third point, if you've been told to stick to the sunnah, and the sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, of the rightly guided caliphs, then you have to know what that is. You have to have knowledge of it to stick to it. That is a prerequisite to the earlier point. Number six, al-Qurbu min ahl al-ilm. To be close to the people of knowledge. That is as well something that is um, that you could not gain knowledge of the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except with knowledge. And you could not gain knowledge properly and from its proper doors except by getting it through the people of knowledge. The seventh point was to remain silent when the people debate and argue. To remain silent about anything in Islam that is not clear to you. Point number eight was to stay away from the people of fitna, confusion, doubts, calamities, innovation, because a man is on the deen of his companion. Stay away from the people who are astray themselves, leading others astray. Point number nine was al hadr min al ma'asiyah, to stay away from disobedience. And we've discussed that already today. And the tenth one was the closing point. It was to mutually advise each other with patience and with the truth. And it was the custom of some of the Sahaba and some of the Salaf that they would depart from one another after having recited this verse and reminding each other with its meanings. Tayyib, so since this affair of straying is so dangerous... The Prophet ﷺ described it as fitanan kaqita al-layl al-mudlam al-mudlam, fitan like trials, work to do good deeds, badiru bil amali fitana kaqita al-layl al-mudlam al-mudlam. Do you know hasten to do good deeds before fitan come? That's like a piece of the dark night, the blackness of night. Yusbihu rajulu mu'minan wa yumsi kafira. He goes, he wakes up in the morning as a believer, and by nightfall he's a disbeliever. وَيُمْسِي مُؤْمِنًا وَيُسْبِحُ كَافِرًا Or he goes uh, at night, he's a believer, and by the morning time he is a disbeliever. يَبِيعُ دِينَهُ بِعَرَضٍ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Selling off his religion for a piece of this worldly life. نعم. And so this hadith is scary. And it shows us that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as this hadith was collected by Imam Muslim in his Sahih, it shows us that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very concerned for the ummah straying after being upon guidance. And that we do good deeds to prevent that. And that if that happens, if we are to go astray, that can happen suddenly without warning. It can take a person by surprise. As you expect right now, and it's early afternoon for you there, as you expect to go to sleep tonight as a Muslim, does this hadith encourage you to have confidence that you will go to bed tonight as a Muslim? This hadith is scaring you. That fitan come, and as you are sitting now, fairly confident that you are a Muslim and you will be a Muslim this evening when you go to bed, Fitan can come and take this confidence from you, take this 
comfort that you have and turn it upside down. And one of us could become a disbeliever by nightfall. And with Allah is the refuge from such an, uh, an occurrence. So if the case is like that, that fitna changes people from a Muslim to a kafir overnight or within a day, then even less than that, we could understand how fitna could come, rip apart a community, rip apart individuals, change a Sunni from a mubtadi, change a Sunni into a mubtadi, change a person who's upon the Sunnah into a person of innovation. If the Messenger وسلم, told us to be afraid of fitnas that will change a person from a Muslim to a disbeliever, then it's easier to understand that a person on the Sunnah could leave the Sunnah and go astray and end up on innovation. Similarly, it should be known that the mutamassik, the person who's vigilant about things in the deen, and he offers extra acts of worship and he's concerned for the acts of the Sunnah, that person could become mutasahil, mutahawin. He could become a person that's heedless and careless about the sunnah of the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A thabit could become da'if. The person who's stable in the religion could become weak and shaky. The person who's an alim, he has knowledge of Islam, can become a jahil. Huh? The person who already has knowledge right now can become a jahil. How does that happen? You know that Allah Ta'ala can raise the knowledge away from the people. Allah Ta'ala can pluck the knowledge out of our chests and remove it instantly from our chests. We are human beings, aslan, and we acknowledge and we everyone knows that they're subject to forgetfulness to some level or another. And fitan, fitan can come and cause a person to stumble and lose everything he knows about Islam. As some of the people who were upon the sunnah and they strayed from the earlier generations. They strayed because they gave into kalam, they gave into philosophy and rhetoric, and they went into great rational uh, thinking, breaking down things with rationale and with their intellects alone. And they ended up, some of them would say, I can barely remember Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah, can you imagine forgetting Surah Al-Fatiha? Some of them said, I can barely even read Surah Al-Fatiha. A person who's honest could easily become a person who lies. And perhaps you've seen it. A close friend can become your enemy because of fitan. A person who loves knowledge and he loves the sunnah and he loves the ulama can become a hater to all of that because of these fitan. A person who's a trustworthy advisor can become treacherous because of fitan. Sincere person can become a show-off. And so on. Every good quality that people are known for can be turned upside down because of fitan. It's no joke. And the steps that we need to take to protect ourselves from fitan, they are no joke. They are very serious. And we should be thinking about them. In this and our future sittings, insha'Allah ta'ala, we're going to be discussing and rehearsing things that can protect the everyday Muslim from the dangers that we have just discussed. And today I'd like to stop uh, after reviewing these 10 points and give you a practical example of how one man in history encountered fitan, how he dealt with it as a good example, and how Allah Ta'ala kept him stable despite everything he faced, despite what you might think was a very bad situation that he lived in for the, la for the latter part of his life, but he ended up being one of the most recognized names that any scholar has ever had in the history of Islam. So let's look now to the great Imam of Hadith. The first name in Hadith that comes to your mind, perhaps after the name of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his illustrious companions. When you think of a scholar of Hadith, the number one scholar of Hadith, who would it be? Would anyone like to throw it out there? His name was Muhammad ibn Ismail 
well known as Al Bukhari. Al Bukhari. Al Bukhari was, as mentioned, the premier scholar of hadith. You hear Bukhari and the other one. Who's the other one mentioned with Bukhari all the time? Imam Muslim. Imam Muslim, some of the scholars said about him, as he was a student of Al Imam Al Bukhari. Some of them said about Al Imam Muslim himself, who's the number two scholar of hadith that people recognize in the history of Islam. They say, Had it not been for Al Bukhari leading the way and teaching Muslim, then Muslim would not have come or went away. Meaning, we wouldn't have anything to do with Muslim. Meaning, he learned the majority of his knowledge and a great a do. A great um, virtue is due to Al-Bukhari by Allah's permission. So Al-Bukhari was the premier hadith scholar of Islamic history. And again, exempting the generations before him, meaning uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, uh, Nam, and those great imams. But Al-Bukhari, as it reaches us today, he's the number one author of the hadith collection. His hadith collection is the very for, very first resource that a Muslim goes to when he wants to uh, get an authentic hadith from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He goes to that book called Sahih Al-Bukhari. So he lived in the 3rd century, the latter part of the 2nd century as a young man, and then into the middle of the 3rd century. And he died in the year 256, right in the middle of that century where all the books began to be compiled and all of the efforts were made to collect the Sunan and to compile them and divide them into Masanid and to Abwab fiqhiyya into chapters based on the companion or chapters based on their fiqh topics. Al Imam al Bukhari was like you and me when it comes to one of the creation, being one of the creation of Allah and being subject to fitna in this life. Huwa ladhi khalaq al mawta wal hayata, limada liyabluakum, ayyukum ahsanu amala. He's the one who created life and death. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ To put you to trial. To test you. Allah Ta'ala is the one who created you. This life and the death in front of you. As all of it is a trial. To see which of you are best in deeds. From Surah Al-Mulk. So Al-Bukhari was subject to the same thing that we are all subject to. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, after having spent his youth traveling around the lands of Mecca and Medina and Khurasan and Basra and Kufa and everywhere, gathering the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he became a very recognized scholar of hadith. So much so that any land he would enter, the people would all line up for a very long distance to meet him and to greet him and to welcome him to their city. And no different was a city called Naysabur. Naysabur was the city having a very important resident there that became the second most famous hadith scholar of history, Muslim Ibn Hajjaj, and Naysaburi from Naysabur. So Al-Bukhari came to Naysabur. In Naysabur, there was a big sheikh in Naysabur. His name was Muhammad ibn Yahya. Ibn Khalid ibn Abdullah ibn Faris, Al-Dhuhli, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, a premier scholar in hadith sciences, especially in one of the most difficult sciences of hadith, ilal, defects, hidden defects of the chains. One of the most knowledgeable and insightful scholars of hadith in his time. He was the Imam of Naysabur. Imam Muslim was busy at that time as a student of Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli. Studying from him, learning the hadith from him and so on. When Al-Bukhari came to Naysabur, you should know that Al-Dhuhli told the people, like all the hadith, all the people of hadith would say, here comes Al-Bukhari, everyone go and greet him. As narrated by Al Hassan ibn Muhammad ibn Jabir, he said, Samitu Muhammad ibn Yahya, Yaqul, 
لما ورد محمد بن اسماعيل البخاري نيسابور اذهبوا إلى هذا الرجل الصالح فاسمعوا منه He said about Imam al-Bukhari, go to this man, this righteous man, and listen to him. Meaning, take the hadith from him. فَذَهَبَ النَّاسُ إِلَيْهِ So the people listened to their imam, the imam of Naysabur, Shaykh Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli. And they went and they huddled around al-Bukhari in circles and circles and circles. And they filled his majlis up and then some. And as the story goes, وَأَقْبَلُوا عَلَى السَّمَاعِ مَنْهُ When they all became very dedicated and devoted to learning the hadith from Al-Bukhari, حَتَّى ظَهَرَ الْخَلَلُ فِي مَجْلِسِ مُحَمَّدِ ibn Yahya. To the point that there was a noticeable decrease, lack of students in the study circles of who? Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli. فَحَسَدَهُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ وَتَكَلَّمَ فِيهِ Then, Jealousy took took its place. And the shaytan is wicked and evil and has his place even amongst the most pious of Allah's servants. He managed to affect this great imam and bring jealousy to his heart. As the scholars of Islam had said throughout history that what Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli did, rahimahullah ta'ala, was done out of jealousy. And you're going to find out what it was and how al-Bukhari was subject to fitna as a result of that. Nam. It was during some gatherings, as we have already introduced the idea here, that Al-Dhuhli became jealous of Al-Bukhari in his social status, that he was the premier scholar and even overtook his status in his homeland. So the people began to go to Al-Bukhari and leave Al-Dhuhli. And so Al-Dhuhli began to look for something to say against Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. So he found his statement, he found his angle of attack, when once, and this is at the time of the Jahmiyyah, a cult that divided itself from the Muslims and separated itself from the Muslims of Ahl Sunnah by a number of deviations. Specifically in this story we're going to talk about how they deviated with regards to the Qur'an. They said the Qur'an initially, the early stage of the Jahmiyyah, was to believe that the Qur'an is created. That Allah Ta'ala created meanings and He sent them to the, He created them and placed them in the Loh al Mahfuz. And from there, Jibreel took them to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who expressed them to the people as words. But those word choices and those phrases and those letters and those sounds coming from the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam according to the Jahmiyyah, none of that was the Qur'an in reality. That was only something that represented the Qur'an. The Qur'an was created and sent down as meanings. Created as meanings and sent down. This is where we hear this statement, is the Qur'an created or not created? And the ah- Ahl Sunnah, the people of the Sunnah we have, a very clear statement that we make about the Qur'an. We say what? The Qur'an is the speech of Allah and not a created thing. Not a creation. It's the speech of Allah, one of His attributes. So it was not created. Allah Ta'ala did not create His own attributes. Rather, they are from Him. And He is Al-Ahad As-Samad. He is the one ever uh, independent Al-Awwal, the first and the last, Al-Akhir, and so on. So Allah Ta'ala did not create His attributes or His actions, but they are described, He is to be described with them as always having done them, or always being described with them. So He said, or so the Jahmiyyah said the Qur'an was created. Ahl Sunnah stood up as they had always done throughout history and identified a statement which contradicted the speech of Allah Ta'ala, the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of the ayat, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ attributing speech to Allah. They said Allah cannot speak and they wanted to exonerate Allah beyond being similar to His creation. They said if Allah speaks, then He must have 
vocal cords and a mouth and tongue and teeth and so on. They said, far removed is Allah from such an idea, so Allah cannot speak. And they sought to describe Allah with no speech. Thus he created what we have as the Qur'an and he sent it down. Clear? This was the intention behind their innovation. They intended to glorify Allah. Good intentions, right? They want to exonerate Allah and glorify Him. So they said, Allah does not speak because if He spoke, that means He would speak with the faculties that we speak with and that would limit Him and make Him similar to His creation. Therefore, He cannot speak. We say, Ahl sunnah Allah speaks in a manner that is befitting to His Majesty. He has described himself with speech. He has described his speech as having letters. As having letters and words. He said, من قرأ, The Prophet وسلم, said, من قرأ حرفا من كتاب الله فله بها حسنة والحسنة بعشر أمثالها Whoever reads one harf, one letter, and some scholars understood that to be one word. However, literally it means one letter from the book of Allah. Then he'll get a reward and each reward will be multiplied ten times its value to the rest of the hadith. The Prophet wasallam described the Quran, the speech of Allah as having huruf. And the Prophet wasallam taught us to seek refuge with Allah. From the kalima, uh, with the kalimat of Allah, from the evil of what He has created. He taught us when we're, when we're traveling and we take a station, a riding station or a, a rest stop, and we stay there overnight or we stop to rest there, that we say, أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق. I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil that He has created. I seek refuge with the words of Allah. This is Allah's speech. If Allah's speech is created, then the Messenger وسلم, has just landed us in shirk. If the speech of Allah was created, which it's not. Because we're now seeking refuge with a creation. Something that Allah had created. And we're not seeking refuge with the Creator. If the speech of Allah, or if the Quran is not the speech of Allah. Since the Qur'an is the speech of Allah and His words are from His attributes, His speech, then we say this is seeking refuge with Allah, with the Creator Himself. And these were some of the responses of Ahl sunnah that they used to declare the Jahmiyyah, the very first stage of the Jahmiyyah, to be disbelievers. Then they had to change. They were forced to change because everywhere they went they were identified and they were tested. What do you say about the Qur'an? If they said the Qur'an was created, then they would face the death penalty as apostates from the religion of Islam through the Muslim rulers, under the Muslim government. So they had to change their position. So they went undercover and they moved into the second stage of the Jahmiyyah called the Waqifa. The Waqifa. They said, I don't know, just to hide their belief. They said, I don't know. Is the Qur'an created or not created? So then the ulama differentiated between the people who really didn't know what they were talking about and the jahmiyyah who sought to hide their beliefs by saying, I don't know if the Qur'an is created or not. And they made takfir of the jahmiyyah who tried to hide behind that statement. Some of them said they were 40 times worse than the original jahmiyyah. Some of them said 70 times. Some of them said many times worse and more disbelieving than the original Jahmiyyah. So once again, they were exposed at the hands of Ahl Sunnah. And they had to move on to a new stage of deception and trickery to keep their beliefs, or some of their beliefs, and to hide their realities. So they began to say, okay, we give up. The Qur'an is the speech of Allah, and it's not created. You might be saying, well, okay, the issue is over now. They have submitted and they have given up their false belief. Ahl al-Sunnah said no. They, what remained with them 
was the belief that the Qur'an that we have with us is not the Qur'an. What is in the Mus'haf is not the Qur'an. What we recite on our tongues is not the Qur'an, but rather it is ibara an al-Qur'an. It's a representation of the Qur'an. It only represents the speech of Allah, which is not here with us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تسافروا بالقرآن إلى أرض العدو Do not travel with the Qur'an to the lands of the enemy. أخاف أن يناله أحدهم I'm afraid or in fear that one of them might get a hold of it. This is in Sahih Muslim. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not travel with the Qur'an to the lands of the enemy. He didn't say the Mus'haf in this narration. He didn't restrict himself to only saying the Mus'haf. But he explicitly said, the Qur'an. Do not travel with the Qur'an. So he referred to what is written in the Mus'ahif as the Qur'an. This is from the tongue of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With regards to the recitations of the people... Allah Ta'ala said, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ If any of the polytheists seek your protection, then grant him your protection so that he hears the speech of Allah. حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ So that he hears the speech of Allah. And Allah did not say, so he hears your recitation of the speech of Allah. Or so that he hears your representation of the speech of Allah. But Allah referred to it directly as the speech of Allah. Based on this clear proof from the book of Allah and others, Ahlul Sunnah said, the lovdiya, they're the ones who said, lovdi bil Qur'ani, lovdi bil Qur'ani makhluq. My recitation of the Qur'an is created. The Qur'an is not created, it's the speech of Allah. But when I recite it, that recitation that comes out, that is not the Qur'an, not the speech of Allah, it's my action, and it's a created thing, as the actions of the servants, the people's actions are all created. Tayyib. Ahl sunnah said, this contradicts the ayat that we mentioned earlier, and they said, whoever rejects a verse from the book of Allah is a disbeliever. Some of them, like Imam Ahmed said, the lavdiya, this third stage of the jahmiyyah, is worse and more disbelieving than the earlier stages. This brings us right back to the story of Al Imam Al Bukhari, because this is the statement that they tried to pin on him during this fitna and in this time where people were being, people were actually spreading this belief as Islam that my recitation or my utterance or my recital of the Quran is created. It's not the speech of Allah itself. This was now going to be attributed to Al Imam Al Bukhari because they tested him with this statement. Let's see how they tested him with this statement. In Naysabur, the people gathered around him. Qama ilayhi rajulun. A man came to him and said, Fakala ya Aba Abdullah, O Abu Abdullah, that was his kunya ma taqulu fil lavdi bil Quran. Makhluqun huwa am gayru makhluq. What do you say about the recitation of the Qur'an? Is it created or not created? The scholars of that time hated to say one or the other. Because it's two issues packed into one issue. The Qur'an being recited is the speech of Allah, not created. Your actions of moving your lips and your efforts are rewarded because they are your actions. There are two separate issues here being smashed into one, and this is one of the pathways of Ahlul Bid'ah that they take, the people of innovation take two separate issues that have two different rulings and push them into one question and demand that you give a ruling on that issue which contains two separate issues. And they will take the answer that fits their desires, that helps them to accuse you of falsehood and they will run with that one. So if you said the Qur'an, the recitation of the Qur'an is created because I'm referring to the actions of the servant. They will say, you have said now the Qur'an is created, so you are a jahmi. If you say, my recitation of the Qur'an is not created, 
because I feel I'm understanding here that the focus is on the idea of it being the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is the speech of Allah and not a created thing. They will say, then you deny that the actions of the servants are created. And you've fallen into a different bid'ah. So there is no correct answer to, is the recitation of the Qur'an created or not created? The person who knows his deen must either refuse to answer the question as it is posed, or he must dissect the question into its two original parts and answer each part with what is appropriate. Let us see what the Imam al-Bukhari did facing this fitna. فَأَعْرَضَ عَنْهُ الْبُخَارِي وَلَمْ يُجِبْهُ Al-Bukhari turned away from him and did not answer. And as we mentioned, one of the ways that you protect yourself from fitna is what? A sukut number seven that we reviewed today. A sukut fi ma yakhuluna fihi. Being quiet about what the people busy themselves arguing and debating about. So he refused to answer. He left it alone. Anyone who would say that statement would be automatically counted as a jahmi. The third stage of the jahmiya called again the lavdiya. And the lavdiya, according to the scholars in general, were also kuffar, even more disbelieving than the earlier sects or offshoots of the jahmiya. فَقَالَ الرَّجُلْ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ So the man said again, O oh, Abu Abdullah, oh, you know, that was the kunya of uh, al-Bukhari, فَأَعَادَ عَلَيْهِ الْقَوْلِ He asked them a second time, فَأَعْرَضَ عَنْهُ Turned away from him again. Didn't want to speak about Allah and his speech, except with clear speech, clear Salafi, upright speech. ثُمَّ قَالَ فِي الثَّالِثَ He asked him a third time, فَالْتَفَتَ إِلَيْهِ الْبُخَارِي So al-Bukhari looked at him, وَقَالَ And he said, القرآن كلام الله غير مخلوق. He said the the Quran is the speech of Allah and it's not a created thing. وأفعال العباد مخلوقة والامتحان بدعة. And the 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 actions of the servants are created, meaning people's actions are created. And testing people with this statement is a bid'a. Forcing people to answer this question in this manner is an innovation. So the man became busy with that. And the people became busy. And they all split up. And after that, Bukhari stayed in his house. The people began to say, he said the lovely bil Quran is makhluk. And it got back to Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli, who was ready to accept that al-Bukhari said, lovely bil Qur'ani makhluk. My recitation of the Qur'an is created. A distinguishing trait or slogan of the Lavdiya sect, the disbelieving Lavdiya sect, the third stage of the Jahmiya disbelievers. Naam. Al-Bukhari, as he said clearly in his answer, as recorded in the books of history with Asanid Sahiha, in the biographies of this great Imam, he said the Qur'an is the Kalam of Allah and it is not a created thing, and the actions of the people are created. As mentioned to you, this is the correct Salafi approach of dissecting a loaded question that has two separate issues pushed into one issue. He broke it down into two different issues and gave the ruling on each one individually. Al-Qur'an kalamullah ghayru makhluq. The Qur'an is the speech of Allah, not a created thing. And then the other issue... وَأَفْعَالُ الْعِبَادِ مَخْلُوقَ The actions of the people are created. Masterfully, with every bit of knowledge and insight and stability in the religion of Allah, spoke with absolute truth and justice about the Qur'an. Yet the people who wanted fitna heard what they wanted to hear, and they narrated what they wanted to narrate. And it got back to Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli, who began, and I know it's getting a bit long and I apologize for that, so I'll summarize the rest of the story. He began to accuse Al-Bukhari of saying, Lovely bil Quran, my, my recital of the Quran is created. The statement of the Jahmiyyah, the statement that has 50 scholars or more 
declaring it to be a statement of disbelief and the one who says it is outside of Islam. He began to order the people to stay away from Al-Bukhari while Al-Bukhari was innocent of this claim. He began openly warning, boycotting and ordering the people to boycott Al-Bukhari to the point where he asked the people in his study circle, Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli, he said, whoever still insists on sitting with that mubtadi', with that person of bid'ah, who is he? Al-Bukhari. Let him get up and get out of my study circle now and not sit with me again. Who was sitting there? Al-Imam Muslim. Studying still after all of these accusations, still studying under a dhuhli. Why? Because he was talib ilm al hadith. He was a student of hadith, collecting, preserving the hadith of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not involving himself in the fitna. Yet when it came to this stance, Imam Muslim said enough. He stood up, got his clothes together and stepped over the shoulders of the people and made his way out, meaning he was very close to the center of the study circle. Al-Imam Muslim then proceeded in anger for what has just taken place, that he was actually kicked out of the study circle of a dhuhli for continuing to sit and take knowledge, to sit with and take knowledge from al-Bukhari, took all of his narrations that he had heard from Muhammad ibn Yahya al and had them sent to his house and thrown upon his door. As if to say, I don't have any need for your narrations now. And I would like to show you here the status of Al-Imam al-Bukhari. Al-Imam al-Bukhari did not do as Al-Imam Muslim did. Al-Imam al-Bukhari had already collected narrations from a dhuhli and had continued to collect narrations from a dhuhli and he did not drop the narrations of a dhuhli. He did not speak ill of a dhuhli. He knew that this was a personal issue. He expressed sentiments to those around him that this was an issue of jealousy. And he chose to turn his affair to Allah and not respond. A man of maturity. He was asked one time, Ya Aba Abdullah, Hada Rajulun Makbulun bi Khurasan Khususan fi hadha fi Medina. It's a man that is his statement is just hands down accepted in all of Khurasan, even especially in Naysabur in this city. He's spoken about this issue so seriously. So that no person is able to confront him about it. فَمَا تَرَاد What do you think we should do? فَقَبَضَ عَلَى لِحْيَتِهِ So he took hold of his beard. ثُمَّ قَالْ وَأُفَوِّضُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ I leave my affair and I turn it back to and I entrust it to Allah. Verily Allah is all seeing with regards to his servants. Allahumma innaka ta'lamu anni lam urid al-maqama bi naysabur asharan wa la batara. Oh Allah, you know that I didn't come to naysabur and take a position in naysabur out of arrogance or pride. Wa la talaban lil-ri'asa. Not to seek a position amongst the people. Wa innama abat alayya nafsi fi ruju'i ila watani li ghalabat al-mukhalifin. I've only remained here because... I refuse myself, my, my inner self refuses to go back to my homeland because of the excessive number of people who oppose the Sunnah. This man has made it a focus to talk about me because of jealousy over what Allah has given me and nothing else. And then he made his intentions to leave Naysabur so that the people would not be put to trial due to him. As he left and as he went to other lands, he found that when he went to another city, a letter from Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Zuhli would be waiting for him. 
in the hands of the governor. Do not let this mubtada' in your city. And so he was exiled and rejected and denied entrance into city after city. At this stage of his life, he was satisfied and content with the qadr of Allah. He did not lash out. He did not turn against one of the scholars of Ahl sunnah who, who wronged him. He remained patient. At this stage of his life, he turned towards what Allah had made easy for him. At that stage, which was, which was to review his writings, to edit, to update, to organize the things that he had written. And much of the well-organized, well-written composition that reached us today, over a thousand years later, is a result of this later stage of his life where he lived in exile. He made the best of it. He, made, he took his time to do what would benefit the ummah long term. He edited his book Sahih al-Bukhari or what he called al-Jami' al-Sahih. He edited it and continued to use the ahadith of al-Dhuhli in that book. Do you guys have Sahih al-Bukhari in the masjid? The concise, uh, the, the, what do you call it, the abridgment or the original? That is nine volumes, that's the original. Go to the ninth volume, Akhi. you got it with you? The hadith are numbered with the numbering system of Muhammad Fuad Abdul Baqi in your printing. So go to hadith number, hadith number, I'll give you one where he names a dhuhli in his chain. Sorry, just give me a second. There you are. Hadith number 7,155. 7155 Kitab al Ahkam. Read the, the beginning of the chain. Allahu Akbar. He, Muhammad ibn Khalid al Dhuhri narrated to us. Allahu Akbar. That's a Dhuhri. That's the one who made his life miserable. That's the one who made him an outcast wherever he went. He remains his sheikh in Sahih al-Bukhari. And he didn't drop him like Muslim dropped him. In that same volume, look at, uh, look at hadith number, uh, number 6785. Yeah, 6785. Kitab al-Hudud. They read the beginning of the chain. Oh, okay. No need. I could give you 20 or 30 hadith like that. If you're interested, I can publish a list of all the hadith of al that are that are still exist to this day in Sahih al-Bukhari. The point is, Look at the humility of this great imam. Look at what was said about him. Attributed to him was a statement of disbelief in falsehood. He never said it. Listen to what he said when they asked him about this statement. Abu Amr al-Khaffaf came to him and said, What about this statement that's attributed to you? He said, Ya Abu Amr, ihfaz ma aqulu lak. Memorize this, what I'm about to say to you. Min za'ama, min ahli naysabur. وقومس والري وهمذان وحلوان وبغداد والكوفة والبصرة ومكة والمدينة anybody from any of these places نيسابور قومس ري همذان حلوان بغداد كوفة بصرة مكة and مدينة any of them anyone from any of these places who says أني قلت لفظي بالقرآن مخلوق فهو كذاب anybody who says that I said my recitation of the Quran is created is a liar 
فإني لم أقوله I never said that إلا أني قلت أفعال العباد مخلوقة The only thing I ever said was that the state, the actions of the people are created. And you heard his statement earlier. So Al-Bukhari, on more than one occasion, cleared himself with every bit of explicit clarification that he never said that. And there is no authentic chain to Al-Bukhari ever that he said, my love of the Qur'an, my recitation of the Qur'an is created. Muhammad ibn Nasr al Marwazi. He also said that I heard Al-Bukhari saying, مَنْ زَعَمَ أَنِّي قُلْتُ لَفْذِ بِالْقُرْآنِ فَهُوَ كَذَّابٌ فَإِنِّي لَمْ أَقُلْهُ Whoever claims that I have said my recitation of the Qur'an is created, then he's a liar. I've never said it. Naam. So Al-Bukhari was free, as free as can be, from this evil statement. And what's strange is I've been reading to you this evening from the... Seer A'lam al-Nubala of a Dhahabi, the biographies of the great scholars written by a Dhahabi in his great uh, collection of, of biographies. This is from the 12th volume. And the people who did the footnotes on this book in Arabic, the, the most famous checking, which is by Shu'ib al-Arna'ut and his team, who are known to be Asha'ira, Ash'aris, and they have deviation as it, believe, as it relates to belief in the speech of Allah and the attributes of Allah. They are so happy to put in their footnotes the exact words that contradict the statements, the clear defense of Al-Bukhari from his own mouth. They still attribute to Al-Bukhari in the footnotes of this book that he said, Love thee bil Qur'ani makhluq. Even after they are the ones who bring it from the manuscript to the published world. Because they're deviants, they're Ash'aris. They would love for Ahl Sunnah to believe about their Imams that they had major deviation in their aqidah. Because if we were to believe that about an imam like al-Bukhari, then we would be lenient when it comes to the deviance of the Ash'aris. We would be, possibly, we would accept their deviance if we could believe that our imams had great mistakes like their mistakes. But alhamdulillah, as you have seen today, al-Bukhari was free of that trial. So al-Bukhari practiced many of the uh, points of advice that were given in our lecture, not meaning that he took our advice, but that he implemented the goodness uh, of the of, of the deen of Allah Ta'ala that we reminded ourselves with regarding how to remain steadfast in the face of trials and fitna. Al-Bukhari removed himself from the situation. Al-Bukhari refused to give in to their deviation or what they wanted. Al-Bukhari remained silent about his critic and did not accuse his critic of anything. And in fact, to this day, you find the ahadith of his critic remaining there in their places in Sahih, Al-Bukhari. And Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar, rahimahullah ta'ala, he has the famous book called Fath al-Bari, which is an explanation of Al-Bukhari. He mentions in his footnotes that when Al-Bukhari narrated the hadith of Al-Dhuhli, فَلَمْ يُصَرَّحْ بِهِ He didn't use his full name. As you notice, Muhammad ibn Khalid, I've been telling you Muhammad ibn Yahya, right? So maybe when you read Muhammad ibn Khalid, you said, maybe that's not the one we're talking about. No, you will see that he's been identified as Muhammad ibn Yahya, ibn Abdullah ibn Khalid, or maybe ibn Khalid ibn Abdullah ibn Faris al dhuhli So sometimes he's uh, mentioned with his name and his grandfather's name. Like we can say about Riyadh, we can call him Riyadh ibn Siddiq, or we can call him Riyadh ibn Mansur. We have examples of that in our Salaf. You've heard of Ibn Taymiyyah, right? Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim ibn Taymiyyah. That's his grandfather's name, Taymiyyah, or his nickname. Tayyib, you have uh, you heard of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. He was Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal. You've heard of Ibn Hajar. He was Ahmed ibn Ali ibn Hajar. You've heard of who? You've heard of Muhammad ibn Sulaiman? Who's that? Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Tayyib. You've heard of this man, Ibn Abdul Muttalib? Ana Nabiyu wala kadib. Ana Ibn Abdul Muttalib. That's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
and his statement that's recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari, أنا النبي ولا كذب أنا ابن عبد المطلب I'm the Prophet, no lie, I'm the son of Abdul Muttalib. Who is Abdul Muttalib? His father or his grandfather? That's his grandfather. He was Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. So from the way of the Arabs was to identify a person and ascribe him directly to his grandfather sometimes. So Muhammad ibn Khalid is Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Khalid or Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Abdullah ibn Khalid ibn Faris al-Dhuhli. Tayyib. So Al-Bukhari used to um, you know, use these kinds of tricks. He would call him Muhammad ibn Abdullah sometimes. He would call him Muhammad ibn Khalid sometimes. Uh, and his full name was Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Abdullah ibn Khalid ibn Faris al-Dhuhli. And in this one occasion, and many times or the most often occasion, or the most often habit of Al-Bukhari was to say, Haddathana Muhammad. That's it. And Bukhari had over a dozen shuyukh named Muhammad. However, the scholars of a hadith would trace that hadith and they would say, which Muhammad was this? And they would find the shaykh of al-Bukhari named Muhammad that had that chain with that narration. And they would say this was a dhuhli in this case. And some of the scholars who specialized in the shuyukh of al-Bukhari, like al-Kilabadi, like al-Hakim, and others, they said there are about 30 narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari, all of them starting with a dhuhli in the chain. So al-Bukhari put his personal pride aside, all the attacks that were made against him personally, and he stuck to the knowledge of the deen and his service to that knowledge of the deen without wavering in the face of this fitna, having stability, sabat, having manhood, having... Uh, confidence in the reward with Allah Ta'ala, even as an exile, even as a despised person to many people. Scholars later came and even accepted the statement of Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli. Two great scholars of hadith that are names right up there with al-Bukhari, Abu Hatim and Abu Zura. They abandoned the hadith of al-Bukhari because of the statements of al-Dhuhli. There was a man who came, the son of Abu Hatim, Ibn Abi Hatim. He has a famous book that you've heard of, possibly called Al Jarh wa Ta'deel. In short, it was a rewriting of one of Al Bukhari's books called Al Tariq Al Kabir, because he didn't believe that Al Bukhari was trustworthy and uh, or or able to or, or reliable enough to have his book uh, used for research. So he rewrote the book, making additions and adjustments and gave it a new name. That's why when you look up narrators in these two books, Al-Tariq Al-Kabir and Al-Jarh wa Ta'deel, you find many times the exact same biography. Naam. So the effects of the slander and the, the jealous accusation that was made against Al-Bukhari had a very big effect on Al-Bukhari in his lifetime. Yet it turned him to goodness. It turned him to other acts of goodness. He was... Easy, sahal, layin, a description of the believer. When he found that it was difficult to teach the people, he simply went on to authorship and editing. That's what Allah had facilitated for him at that stage. And al-Bukhari remained silent about his critic because he knew his critic did not deviate from Ahl-Sunnah. He knew his critic was simply overcome with a personal issue. So he did not speak back against his critic. And in fact, he kept his hadith in his book. Subhanallah. When you think of this situation, then you understand why it is that Allah Ta'ala grants status to some people over others. And in the end, you see here the steadfastness, the stability of Al-Bukhari, the patience, the tolerance, the forbearance. Where is the name of Al-Bukhari today in the hearts and in the homes of the people? And where is the name of Al-Dhuhli in the hearts and the names of the people. Many of you this evening, or this afternoon, this is maybe the first time you've heard the name Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli. It's a name not known to many people outside of the study circles of hadith. And the name of al-Bukhari? You can hardly find a Muslim who doesn't know his name. Allah Ta'ala raises some people by way of this book, the Qur'an. And He lowers Others by way of it.
Having said that, Nam, you guys are tired. صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. طيب نعم سبحان الله if you were to trace the ahadith of al-Bukhari that he narrates from al-Dhuhli you would find beautiful advices for people who need to hear these certain hadith which would indicate to you that maybe there was something with al-Bukhari in that he was choosing certain hadith that Al-Dhuhli needed to hear as a reminder. But he didn't say anything about that, and there's no real way to confirm that. But you find some amazing hadith that come from the chain of Al-Dhuhli. And I'll remind you, or myself, of them along with you, because perhaps some of our sisters, as mentioned in the question, would like to hear some of these reminders. And one of them was that the Messenger wasallam said, in the last Hajj, when he asked them, what month is this? Or what month has the greatest sanctuary? They said, this month. Shahrana hadha. This month of ours. Dhul Hijjah. The month of Hajj. Ala ayyu baladin ta'alamunahu a'adhamu hurmatan. A'adhamu hurmatan. You know any city that has more of a sanctuary than this? Qalu ala baladuna hadha. Nothing but this city of ours. قَالَ أَلَا أَيُّ يَوْمٍ تَعْلَمُونَهُ أَعْظَمُ حُرْمَةً What day do you know that's more of a sanctuary than this day? And this day was, in some narrations, يَوْمُ عَرَفَةً In some narrations, يَوْمُ nahr In some narrations, يَوْمُ tarwiya The eighth, or perhaps the ninth, or perhaps the tenth day of Dhul Hijjah. All of them having a sanctuary. All of them being very important days and very sacred days, days of Hajj. And some of the scholars have said that he repeated this admonishment on all three days, so there's no need to decide which day it was that he actually gave this admonishment on all three of those days. What was the admonishment? He said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى قَدْ حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ وَأَعْرَاضَكُمْ إِلَّا بِحَقِّهَا كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا فِي بَلَدِكُمْ هَذَا فِي شَهْرِكُمْ هَذَا Verily Allah has made a sanctuary, made as something sacred between you, Muslims. Your physical safety, your dima, your financial possessions, your wealth, and your honor. The honor of a Muslim is to be upheld by the other Muslim. إِلَّا بِحَقِّهَا Except with a right of Islam. Meaning, the person who is accused of something in front of a judge, the person who is uh, being accused of a crime, we must hear the accusation and the proof and so on. When we speak ill of people for a reason, when a person spreads falsehood uh, or harms the people, we must warn the others of him and so on. Whenever there's a right of Islam that is given precedence, we put back the right of an individual's honor. However, the general ruling is, your physical safety, your property, and your honor amongst yourselves is the sanctuary, is a sanctuary, or it is sacred. It must be sacred to you, like the sanctuary of this day of yours, in this month of yours, in this land of yours. Meaning, the days of Hajj, in the month of Dhul Hijjah, in the land of Mecca. That's the sanctuary of the honor of another Muslim. So when it comes to 
And this is one of the hadith of al-Bukhari who, that he narrates from Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli in his Sahih. Uh, now, uh, another one that we could hear that would also encourage us to honor our brothers and sisters in Islam could be the statement that he narrates from Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli. He said, من قا... إذا قال الرجل لأخيه يا كافر فقد باء به أحدهما The person says to his brother you disbeliever he refers to him as a disbeliever then that accusation comes back on one of the two of them meaning on either the accused or the accuser so the accusation of kufr is a very dangerous one furthermore Al-Bukhari narrates from Adhuhli One, give me a second. Well, I could add to that the narration, which is I don't know if it's a narration from a Dhuhri, from a Bukhari's narration from him, but we could say that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbade the people from boycotting each other over personal matters for more than three days. So if you have a personal grudge with someone, a disagreement that causes you to not want to sit with that person, then this act of avoiding that person may not go on for longer than three days. Meaning within those three days you are to rectify. Fear Allah and rectify what lies between you amongst yourselves. When there are personal disputes and personal differences not based on khilaf aqadi or manhaji, not based on differences in aqidah and manhaj, they are based on character, differences, personality, mismatches, and things like this, then there is a limit set by the sharia of three days, set by the Messenger wasallam, that a man may not stay away from and refrain from speaking to his brother for more than three days, meaning on personal matters of difference. Whoever goes beyond that has transgressed the limits of Allah. وَمَنْ يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهِ Anyone who transgresses the limits of Allah, he's oppressing his own self. Do not transgress the limits of Allah Ta'ala. وَاصْلِحُ بَيْنَكُمْ Fix what is between yourselves. Speak truthfully and honestly. Be people of maturity who give up personal differences that don't relate to compromising anything in Islam. Give up a claim that is a dunya claim to settle a dispute and be the better party. Be the one to initiate the salams and be the better party. Be the one to apologize for bad treatments or bad statements that have come from you and try to begin the process of islah because Allah Ta'ala has ordered us with islah with rectifying things between ourselves and not allowing things to get out of hand and to become disputes and discord and a split community so do not allow the shaitan to remain between yourselves but seek refuge with Allah Ta'ala from allowing the shaitan to remain between you and your brothers and sisters in Islam and Allah Ta'ala as the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَمَنْ يَتَحَرَّ الْخَيْرِ يُعْطَاهُ Whoever seeks after something good, if you serious, seriously intend to patch up broken ties, then you'll be given what you seriously and honestly go after. We ask Allah Ta'ala to grant you success. وَإِلَيْكُمْ What's better is to be silent and to go to that person and advise him privately and to let the people of good character, people of concern, people of knowledge, people of upright character step in and advise and intervene rather than taking personal revenge and uh, repaying an evil thing with another evil thing. 
as Allah Ta'ala orders us with these kinds of issues. Repel repel that bad thing with something which is better. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ You'll find that the one that there was animosity between you and him suddenly becomes a very close and dear friend. What's the step that you're required to take to get there? إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Repel the bad treatment with that which is better. Naam. And that's much harder and much more of a jihad within yourself than getting your revenge that you may feel you rightly deserve or speaking with a statement against a person who has wronged you. Rather, idfa' billati hiya ahsan, and Allah knows best. I'm not dictating to my brothers in this masjid what's permissible and not permissible to ask. I'm not a sheikh or a scholar or something, man. I'm one of you guys. Allah is public. But I, you know what I'm going to say, Salah, though? May Allah bless you for your show of manners here. Because in the West, sometimes you might treat a student of knowledge like with the kind of language you would treat if you had one of the mashayikh with you out of practice. And if that's what it's coming from, then alhamdulillah, then that's you practicing that you're going to have telelinks and you're going to have interaction with the ulama and this is how you would treat them. Rafa'akallah. Wiyakum. Wafikum. Naam. Ayuh. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I can investigate that narration specifically, uh, as I don't know if it's authentic or not. But I will say, as with regards to the fiqh of that understanding, that we don't know any scholar who said that taking off the khufs breaks the wudu. As the scholars have clarified and listed the things that break your wudu. And I don't know of, and I've never heard of, and I would highly doubt that there would exist a claim that taking the socks off breaks the wudu. And that's what you would have to have to say that you wiped over the socks, so therefore when you take the socks off, the wudu goes away. You would need someone to say clearly with evidence that taking off the socks that were used as part of the wudu, that were wiped over for wudu, is something that's from the nawaqid of wudu. It's from something that breaks the wudu. And I don't know of that ever being mentioned, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. إذا كان رافضيا عاميا فهذا ينصح ويعلم إذا كان رافضيا داعيا فهذا يجتنب يجنب من المسجد ويحذر منه سؤالك بالعربي يجنب إذا كان داعيا إلى مذهبه يجنب إذا كان عاميا يصبر عليه ويعلم That's the general guidelines we hear over and over again from our ulama about the rafidah and the generality of Ahlul Bid'ah like them whose bid'ah is severe. The caller, the one who is an open caller, he invites people to their way and so he has a heart.